Okay, well, good morning again. My name is Rob. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we're going to talk about the goat. Cue the, there it is. There's the goat. Okay. Now, when I was growing up, that was a goat. I picked a cute one. He's smiling, got a tongue hanging out. I wanted to be a nice, friendly goat. But over the years, the term goat has changed. Do you know what it stands for now? Yes. The goat. Repeat after. Well, don't repeat yet. The goat. Greatest of all time. Say it with me. Greatest of all time. So as, as the youth are taking the, our term of goat and they're moving it to the greatest of all time, we're going to play a little game because I have to get you to think about the goat today because that's what we're going to talk about, the goat. So start thinking about sports and thinking about heroes and famous people because I did some research for you guys and we're going to have some fun here for just a minute or two, okay? So the first area we're going to talk about is boxing. So think about boxing through the years. Who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Say it. Yeah, I know. Say it to someone around you because I'm going to hold you accountable. Okay, reveal who's the greatest boxer of all time. Muhammad Ali, if you got it right, give yourselves a hand. Who got it right? A couple of you. Cassius Clay, okay. He's the goat for boxing. And the next one hurts a little. This, for me, it's great. It may hurt you a little. But for basketball, who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Reveal. Michael Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. I live in Chicago. That, that makes me feel good. But people argue LeBron, Kobe. Wilt Chamberlain. Oh, it, it's going to get louder in here. Prepare yourselves. Here we go. Baseball fans. Who's the goat in baseball? Who's the greatest of all time? Say it to someone around you. Reveal. It is Babe Ruth. It is Babe Ruth. Okay, next one. We're going to go to swimming now. I, had to, I have to appeal to everybody, so there's a lot of categories here. The greatest swimmer of all time. This person has more than twice as many Olympic medals as anyone else. Who is it? Reveal? Michael Phelps. Yes, it's Michael Phelps. I remember when he, when he beat Mark Spitz's record and they called him and they, they talked about it. Okay, this one hurts a lot, but we got to go to football. All right, we're going to football now. Greatest of all time. This may sting a little. The, the two of you that are rooting for this guy, you can go ahead and get loud, okay? Think about it. Say who it is. Reveal? Hmm. I know I heard someone say Montana. I'm with you, but it's just not. Right now, it's Tom Brady. Okay, a couple more. Greatest tennis player of all time. Who's the GOAT of tennis players? Talk about it. Say it. Reveal. Serena Williams. By far, Serena Williams is currently the GOAT. Greatest of all time tennis. Okay, I wanted to get the best athlete. So this could be the decathlon. This could be a gymnast. So I went gymnastics next. So think about it. Who's the greatest gymnast of all time? Who's the GOAT? Talk amongst yourselves. Say it. Reveal. It is Simone Biles by far. Most achievements, most awards, most records, Simone Biles. Okay, now I want to go to the fastest person on the planet. So we're going track and field now. Who's the GOAT for track and field? Go ahead and say it. Reveal. Usain Bolt. It is Usain Bolt, by far. In fact, when I was researching this for you guys, watching one of his 100-meter runs is just, it's like he had another gear. He just took off. Now, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. I lived in Chicago a long time and also Minnesota. So I had had hockey. I hope that's okay with you guys, but I added hockey. So who's the greatest hockey player of all time? Who's the GOAT? Say it. Reveal. It is Wayne Gretzky. Good job. I heard a lot of Gretzkys out there. Thank you. Number 99. Now, as we're having fun and I'm trying to get you to understand who's the goat, who's the greatest of all time, could it be this guy? This is our current representation of Jesus. This is our current representation. Now, I, I also researched this for you. There were seven Hollywood movie actors that have played Jesus. Could have been Jim Caviezel, Passion of the Christ. But I chose The Chosen because that's currently the best visual representation of the Bible that you're going to see. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't heard about it, write it down, put it in your phone right now. The Chosen it is a free series, check it out. But surely Jesus could be the goat. He could make himself the fastest, the best swimmer, the, 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 the greatest hockey player, whatever he wanted to. But what's so interesting about Jesus is he was asked this very question. He was asked, Jesus, who's the goat? Who's the greatest? And he answers that question. We're gonna talk about it right now. If you are able and willing, would you please stand in honor of God's word as I read this story to you? Now, this is a tricky one to read, so I'm just going to read it, and you can follow along on the screen. 
It's out of Luke 22, 24 through 27. Here we go. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, the one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thanks for allowing us to have fun, but to truly understand who's the greatest and how do I become greatest in your kingdom, God? Thank you for telling us the way. Thank you for showing us the way. And thank you for modeling it for us. Holy Spirit, like a flame, rest upon my tongue. Give me the words you want me to speak and allow everyone here to have soft hearts and open minds to receive the message you want them to have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, so uh, recently my daughter graduated from Cal, then she went to law school at Santa Clara. She just graduated law school, and then I didn't see her for three months. She's just gone. She took the bar last week. So I, I, I consider it like Groundhog's Day. I'm like, baby, I never saw you, and then you just popped out. It's over. So we celebrated, and we're so excited, and we can't wait. But we were texting last night, and she said, Rob, I recently went on this boat trip, and it reminded me of uh, our mission trip to Sweden. I thought, oh my gosh, those were some of the best years of our lives. I've had the privilege of doing missions all over the world. Costa Rica, Honduras, Haiti, uh, Africa, China. But my country that I was representing for my last church was Sweden. And you may think, Sweden, why, what mission work do you do there? Wealthiest, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, technologically advanced. Ironically, it's a very godless society, sadly. They're post-Christianity, they're post-religious movements. Highest teen suicide rate in the world. And so we would go there to help them. And so when I got assigned this task, which was just 10 years of pure joy for me, going back and forth, I went over to meet with the pastors and I said, okay, you know, we're, we're growing this big church in Texas. And I'm like, okay, what do you guys need? We can bring over a worship team. I can bring over speakers. We can bring over uh, weeks of camps and Bible schools and all these things. I said, what do you guys want? And they sat back and they said, Rob, where we're at in our spiritual journey in our country, we just need you guys to come over and just serve. I thought, are you sure you don't? And then I went back in my managerial mode. And I'm like, what about this, 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 this? Just come over and serve. So our first trip over there, I took 30 young adults and we went over. And we met at a summer camp. It was in June. And we, we showed up to just serve. And so we worked the cafeteria food and we would serve all these teenagers and young adults. We would perform, um, we, we would run the games at the summer camp. And we'd all just hang out and be together and just serve. Uh, the Swedes have a wonderful thing, called, wonderful thing called fika. And every afternoon they get coffee and a pastry and they sit down and you just talk. And when we would have these moments, the teens would slowly just, they'd just kind of get comfortable and trust began to build and walls would come down and we would talk. And just by arriving with a group and serving for weeks, we began to understand who they were and what they were all about and what they needed. And that is what serving is all about. Today's society will tell you something different. Today's society says, self-promote, self-promote. Social media has made that just beautiful. In fact, listen to this. In a recent poll, teenagers were asked what they wanted to do when they grow up. 54% said they wanted to be a celebrity. They want to be an influencer. They want to be the GOAT, the greatest of all time. So as society keeps heading this way of self-promotion, perfect pictures, filter the picture, make sure the bio is perfect, Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Can you see what's happening in the, in the world? That's what's happening today. Jesus' message to us goes against self-promotion. If you want to follow Jesus, as I said, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. Let's look at Matthew 23, 11. The greatest among you will be your servant. So serving is an action that reflects who we are. When I am serving others, I'm serving Christ. When I serve in the children's ministry on a Sunday, I'm serving Christ. When I, when I serve teenagers on Wednesday, I'm serving Christ. When I work at the House of Hope in recovery ministries, I'm actually serving Christ. Because being a servant is not what I do. Being a servant is who I am. When you look in the mirror every day and you look, do you see a servant? Do you think about who can I help today? How can I make someone's life a little bit better? 
We're gonna go to Acts 9.36 now. Listen to this. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas, which means gazelle. She was always doing good and helping the poor. So Dorcas was always doing good and helping the poor, and that's how she was known. That's what she did. That's how everyone in the city knew her. What did she do? She made clothing, and she would help the widows, and she would feed the poor. She was so good at this, I mean, it's in your Bible, it's been studied for 2,000 years, that when she died, Jesus allowed Peter to resurrect her because they wanted her to come back to do good and help the poor. That's the kind of role model that we need to have for our kids, our teenagers, our neighbors, our coworkers. So how do we become a faithful servant? I'm gonna share three stories with you guys, a different angle on the story. So we're gonna start with King David. You've probably heard of King David, He's the one that had the sling and the stone, and he killed who? Goliath, the giant Goliath. It's a great story. I love to tell it. You know, he's got the pebble. He's got the sling. He goes. He was too small to wear the armor. He couldn't, he couldn't pick up the sword. None of that stuff. He just needed a sling. Stone sinks into Goliath's head. He falls. That might have killed him. We don't know. But David, to make sure, went over, took Goliath's sword, and finished him off right there. It's the best part of the story. And where you know David as a great king, and incredible stories, statues, artists, paintings, all over the world about King David, I'm going to tell you a story that you may not know. David was the youngest of eight. David's father's name was Jesse. One day God told Jesse, he said, I want you to give David a task. Send David out to the front lines where his brothers are fighting and have him take a lunch and see how they're doing. Let me read it to you. 1 Samuel 17. One day Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. Give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they're doing. Small task, menial task, but he's serving. God's testing him. This may seem insignificant, but serving others behind the scene is what's important. The way it works in the kingdom is you'll be given little tasks to serve others, and then bigger ones will come following your obedience. So David went and did this. He was obedient. And usually when something like this happened, they would bring back like a token so that Jesse knew it was from one of his brothers, maybe a piece of their uh, shirt that they were wearing or a token of some sort. He did it faithfully, and this began his rise to be the great King, king David that, that we all know. Second story. As Jesus rode the donkey in on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that was a prophecy that was 553 years before he did it. He had to have a donkey. So Jesus is with his disciples. He's teaching. He's doing his thing. The time has come for the triumphal entry back into Jerusalem. He says to his disciples, okay, here's what I need. I need a colt, never been ridden. Here's where you go. Turn left here, turn right here. You'll see him, untie him and take him. And the disciples, they say this. Jesus tells them, Luke 19, 31, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say, the Lord needs it. So as David provided a lunch to serve, we don't know much about the owner of the donkey, but we know this. He was successful. We don't know how many donkeys he had, but he had several because he gave the one that had never been ridden. He didn't give the old worn out one that was heading off to the glue factory. He gave him the brand new one that had never been written because that was the prophecy. So in this man, here's what we know. His identity was a businessman. His influence was his, his livestock, okay? And his income came from that. So when the disciples went to him to say, they just started taking it, he said, what are you doing? The Lord needs it. He said, great. He'd heard of Jesus. He knew who he was. Take it. That's how he served. That's how the businessman served. Listen to this. One of the reasons this story is so powerful is because it shows that no preparation had been made for borrowing the donkey. Jesus was king, he was sovereign. Therefore, it was important that he didn't ask for permission. The man was serving, not questioning, and simply provided the donkey that had never been ridden. Okay, third story. We're gonna go back to the Last Supper. Most all of you have heard of the Last Supper. Thursday night, upper room, Jesus is preparing for what he knows he has to go do. It's Passover, so they're having a meal. This is the moment, as many churches in the world, we argue about so many things, but on communion, we can come together. We can come together for that moment. So this is the night in the upper room. He knows what's gonna happen. His disciples are all there with him. He takes the bread, he breaks it, 
This is this bread, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do it in remembrance of me. Takes the cup. This cup, this wine, this juice symbolizes my blood shed for you. Take and drink. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. One of the most holy, sacred times. All the churches unite on that. And do you want to know what happened right then? The disciples got in a fight arguing about what? Who's the goat? I'm serious. This is what they were doing. Our king of kings and lord of lords getting ready to go die, take punishment for all our sins. And the disciples go, all right, Jesus, this has been great. Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who's the goat? Listen to this. Peter, was it Peter? Peter got to walk on water. Peter got the keys to the kingdom. Was it him? Was it John whom Jesus loved? When you read the book of John and it says John, the disciple that Jesus loved, do you know he wrote that? He wrote that about himself. Read that again. You'll love it. James and John, they were the sons of thunder. Do they deserve to be the goat? I'm sure they were wondering. Simon the zealot was literally an assassin turned uh, warrior for Jesus. Certainly he deserved to be the best. Doubting Thomas, who had to have proof, probably not him. Matthew, the hated tax collector, could he be the goat? Judas, probably not. <laughs> Bartholomew, most of you don't even know a disciple called Bartholomew, do you? Okay, but he was there. They're fighting. And Jesus, I cannot imagine what he was thinking, but he knew his work wasn't done. They wanted to know who the goat was, so Jesus, as always, modeled, mentored, and showed them with his actions, not just his words. Let me read it to you, John 13, 4 and 5. So Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. You see, Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve others. I want to give you a little bit more detail about this. Washing feet was the lowest rung on the social ladder, the lowest job you could have. And so Jesus knew in that moment while the disciples are fighting and they're arguing and they're saying, I'm the greatest, I want to be the greatest. Who's the greatest? Who's the goat? Jesus gets on his knees. Now understand that in this time, they wear sandals. It's hot. The roads are dirt. The dirt sticks to your skin. There are animals, donkeys, camels, cows, goats, that walk on these same roads. They eat food, they drink water, and therefore, there you have it. So it's important we understand this. That's when Jesus got on his knees. The disciples then began to say, whoa, whoa, whoa no, 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 you can't wash our feet. And he said, no, no, I have to. So our, our God, in that moment, our, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Chosen One, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, the one who was and is and is to come, got on his knees and he washed their feet. Because one of his last messages to them while they're fighting and arguing about who's the greatest is he had to answer that question. Serving isn't what we do. Serving is who we are. When I serve others, I'm serving Jesus. I have three more verses for you guys. Listen to this. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. Well done, my good and faithful servant. What you have done to the least of these, you have done for me. When you provide a meal to someone in your small group, someone who's hurt or sick or whatever, you are providing that meal to Jesus. When you visit someone in prison or when you write them a letter like we do in student ministry, you are writing that letter to Jesus. When you welcome a visitor on a weekend or during the week who's uncomfortable and doesn't know where they are or where to go, you are welcoming Jesus. When you pray for someone else at the end of the service or during the week or, or in small group, whenever you do it, you are praying to Jesus. When you give water so that, that a water well can be dug in Africa, you are doing that for Jesus. When you go out on mission, when you serve in ministry, you are doing all these things as if you're doing it for the Lord. So how do you become great? How do you become the goat? When you make it less about you and more about him. It's not about the big things. It's about who you are when no one's looking. When we put others' needs ahead of our own. So to answer the question that I opened with, who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Jesus said the goat is the one who serves others. Now, in order to put an exclamation mark on this message, I am gonna turn this over to my good friend, Danny Bush, 
And Danny has some incredible words for you guys, and then you're going to meet the real stars of the weekend. the king of this kingdom should I, say, should I say that all again as you all hear me I just love this idea of the upside down kingdom where uh, really what Rob talked about is this this is the epitome of that where the king of the kingdom is known as a servant not as one being served where power is gained by giving power away and so we're going to spend some time over this year talking about this idea of serving and how that fits into our vision of introducing Silicon Valley to Jesus but we wanted to kind of kick that off today um, and just just kind of set this set the foundation for that um, and we wanted you to just hear from some people who do this on a daily basis um, and many of you could be on this panel but um, I asked these folks to join me today so we could hear from them so would you guys come on up and would you welcome members of our Calvary family who are faithful servants come on up guys as they come up uh, we've got First up here is Landon, and then Emery, and we've got Charlie and Grace. Come on up. Guys, take a seat. So um, we're just going to walk through some questions, and thanks for, thanks for uh, eavesdropping on a conversation with us. This will be fun. Um, but uh, So this is Charlie and Grace. We've got Landon and Emery. Uh, Charlie and Grace, you guys have been serving here at Calvary for a long time. Um, and we are so grateful for that. But would you just tell us a little bit about where you serve and how long you've been serving there? Sure, Danny. We, uh, Grace and I have been serving here for about 20 years, and we normally serve at the toddlers and the infants. That's awesome. Um, all three of my kids have been in your classroom, so I'm super grateful um, for you two in particular. Um, Landon, one of the things, you've served in a lot of ways. You served on our search committee earlier this year. Your wife um, serves on the worship team. Um, but one of the things that's been cool to watch you and your family as you've gotten into school and all that stuff is you've really t been intentional about serving uh, the people that have been put around you, whether it's your kids, friends, parents, or your neighbors or whatever. So, uh, but that's been a journey. So could you just talk a little bit about how, how that process started, what started it for you? Sure. Um, it, <laughs> I'm an introvert by nature, so this is very, it's not a natural thing for me. Um, as well as uh, I'd be remiss not to say that none of this would have happened without my wife, who does <laughs> way more uh, of the work than me. But we're entering an interesting season where, uh, for the first time, our kids are all in, um, most of our kids are in school systems. So we've got a second grader, a uh, kindergartner, and then one here in Kitty Campus. And so um, not only that, uh, just kind of getting to know people in the neighborhood, some of that's just saying yes to a weird birthday party invite of parents you don't know, or some of those things have been really fun uh, to start to get to know and um, people that I would have never really crossed paths with. So it's been fun. Cool. And Emery, you have served at Calvary in lots of ways, but several years ago you started a ministry that we've talked a lot about and has had a profound impact on the community here called Shining Stars. Could you talk a little bit about why you started it and a little bit about it? Sure. I started it with um, my co-lead, um, Joyce Roberts, and about 17 years ago, a little bit more, um, Calvary uh, was ready for us to get going on um, a ministry for special needs um, kiddos and their families, and um, so I've been doing that since. That's awesome. So the reason that we brought the three of them up here is because there's lots of different ways to serve, and so Charlie and Grace, among many other things, but you serve here at Calvary, Landon, you serve here at Calvary, but you also are just involved in the people that are around you. Emory, you serve here at Calvary, but you also serve in the community. So a lot of times we talk about serving, and at least for me, the thing that comes to mind is, well, I gotta, I gotta do this thing. I gotta sign up to volunteer in this way. And that certainly may be uh, one of them, but what we wanted to just talk about for a little bit here is what it looks like to serve in these different ways. And so um, we kind of jumped over this, but you two have been serving with toddlers for 20 years. That's pretty incredible, right? Anybody? <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So tell me a little bit about why. Why, why do you continue to do that? Well, 
We um, initially started serving uh, because we wanted to meet more uh, people, more families, so this church would seem smaller for us. And as our kids got older, we wanted to serve as a family. And I don't, you have other, she has other reasons. Yeah, our, our kids are 19 and 21, so um, I'm just really here to get my baby fixed. So, you, so you, guys, you guys are actually doing me a favor. <laughs> Well, I love that because one of the things we talk about is like we want you, if you're going to sign up to serve in a ministry, we want you to serve in an area that you feel passionate about and gifted in. And you certainly are gifted. Like Kids love to hang out with you and you love to play, play and hang out with the kids and you've invested in so many kids. So thank you. Thank you for continuing to invest even though your kids are grown up. Um, Landon, like we said, what you're doing, it's not something you sign up for or like RSVP to do. So w when we're talking about being intentional with the people around you and serving your neighbors and th that kind of thing, what does that look like on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Again, I'll take credit here for things that isn't, aren't always things that I do. My wife does a lot of this stuff, but um, I think ultimately it's showing up. You know, ultimately um, serving comes from a relationship. Um, you hear it a lot and um, sometimes these relationships you stumble into based on school or birthday parties, drop-offs and whatever. Um, I think ultimately trying to take that next step into um, like how, how could I help you? How could I drop your kid off? How can I help this neighbor with, we're in a really cool neighborhood up in the mountains where we get lots of opportunities to help each other and that's been great um, and really cool for some of our relationships there locally and then within the school system, um, it's been really cool to get to know a lot of these families, a lot of, you know, both fam both parents are working, and so how can I pick up a kid here, play date here? Um, sometimes it's us asking for help that really is the ultimate way to be able to serve others, is kind of breaking that barrier of, of, uh, of a relationship that's more than just a, a casual one. Yeah, that's cool. Emery, you started a ministry here, you served here, and you, again, you just had, that ministry has had a profound impact, but you've also shared that you serve outside of the church and you view some of what you do outside of the church as your service to the community. So could you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Sure. Well, so tangibly with Shining Stars, just giving families a break um, as we have four hours to play with um, the kids and do cool things. And those families can go out and have um, a date night or catch up on bills, um, but also to be able to have coffee with a mom and listen or be able to um, share something that I've already gone through and there, walk them through the process of a hard um, moment in their lives. Um, but then I'm also a teacher, and so to be able to foster relationships with my students and their families and my colleagues is another way that I can serve and um, to walk alongside them, um, to love my students and be able to um, have stronger relationships with them. Um, it's great. I love that. I love that you think of your, your job as a way of serving in that, in that area and the kids that you've been given, the families you've been given to serve them. That's really, really cool. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, so for you two, um, over 20 years of serving in this way at, in Calvary Kids, what, how have you seen God work? What, what are some things that you've seen God do over that time? Well, through the years, I know that we appreciate the, uh, the church staff more, um, what they have to do. Uh, we appreciate the other volunteers, like when we're just taking care of little kids, we, we see the three or four year olds and you know how much energy they have. We're like, we're not gonna go there. That's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of energy. And then we have you know, people volunteer for the Shining Stars, we have the missionary teams, we got the GO teams. And so what we kind of think of it as we're trying to do kind of our small part in all this and uh, our appreciation for the, the other groups um, of people that we think are probably more challenging and spend a lot of time and effort, um, we, our appreciation for them just really goes up. And um, we have also met a lot of uh, people, a lot of families that made, um, impact on us and that's what we cherish the most yeah. yeah that's really special and and again i'll just say it to you again but the the amount of kids that you've impacted and then the families that you've impacted i mean hundreds and thousands of kids over 20 years so thank you so much for for your faithfulness in that um landon what what is it when you're just talking about being intentional what is what is some of the fruit of just showing up like you said look like it's uh 
just thinking about the question, it's a really funny question because it feels selfish, right? Some of it's just been great relationships, you know, ones that we've benefited from greatly. Um, <laughs> if I can be transparent with you guys, which I've got the microphone, so I guess, <laughs> I guess I can. But um, it, this is a difficult thing for me, uh, just like that idea of you're trying to win somebody and some of those things that I've got an agenda for somebody and um, just the experience for me has been really disarming from some of those things, just to like enter into a relationship, just to love on somebody else, have them love on us, um, and ultimately just start to normalize some difficult conversations. Uh, as probably many of you guys know, parenting tough. And like normalizing a conversation that we come at from slightly different angles around identity and difficulties on bullying and all those things that we're dealing with our kids um, and, and, and trying to kind of unite from different areas has been really, really cool to um, just enter into some really good dialogue to normalize what I would call a spiritual conversation. They might not call it that, um, but ultimately it's been really, really, uh, I think, important to start to, um, I think, just normalize it, right? Maybe break stigmatisms. I don't know. Um, I don't actually know the full fruit yet, but ultimately it's just been great relationally. I think one of the things that Rob was talking about is that idea of being, if we're talking about the kingdom of God, just being ambassadors of the kingdom wherever we are. And so I love that that's the posture that you're taking into those relationships. Um, Emery, what about you? What's, what's just the story of how you've seen God move um, over your time of serving? So it's fun when God orchestrates my two worlds coming together. Um, in March 2021, I volunteered as Shining Stars was partnering with the um, Calvary Kids Ministry to do a drive through egg extravaganza. Um, so I'm at my station passing out the eggs and greeting the families and this um, wheelchair accessible van pulled up and so I'm ready to smile and hand out my egg and I look in the van and I said the student's name and she looked back at me and said my name, Mrs. Pega. And at that moment it was so cool because it was one of my students, a student who I was having a really challenging time engaging with and um, getting her to read online. Um, that was not her favorite. But then all of a sudden she saw me um, as someone who attends Calvary, who loves God, or she started to see that. and. Um, and someone who cares and loves for um, the, our special needs community, just as she has someone special in her life with special needs and her teacher. And that made our relationship, as she's still my student this year, so much stronger and um, amazing. And so um, that was super fun and nothing I could do on my own, but God arranged. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, that's just a brief introduction into this conversation, but would you thank this crew with me? Thank you so much for the ways that you serve here, the way you serve in your community and serve your people.